The British government in India has not only deprived the Indian people of their freedom, but has based itself on the exploitation of the masses and has ruined India. We believe that India must sever the British connection and attain complete independence. Jawaharlal Nehru, President of the Indian National Congress, January 1930. Indian nationalism has grown in strength and ambition. In a series of reforms, Britain makes concessions towards Indian self-government. But imperial zealots are horrified at the prospect of relinquishing the Raj. Viscount Rothermere. British rule in India is irreplaceable. It has been bought by British lives and built up by British capital. If we had not gone to India, she would still be in a state of semi-barbaric anarchy. Our duty there is not to argue with base agitators, but to govern. Less than 100,000 British rule 315 million Indians. Marjorie Asher is governess to the children of an army colonel in Chakrata. Entertaining in this country is very simple. You just tell the servants how many are coming and they see to everything. We have nine servants, including the ayah, the head servant, who acts as valet to Colonel Sterling, the kitmutgar, who waits at table and looks after the silver, and the dobi, or washerman, who does our clothes very well indeed. For some British women, India offers the promise of adventure. Army wife, Florence Riddle. The way in which most women in India pass their days is too boring for me. I have never been nervous of natives. For there is something in our white blood which gives us a feeling of superiority over black blood. I've learned that when one passes a strange bundle of dirty rags, it is not a dangerous lunatic but merely a holy Hindu. Extreme dirt seems to accompany extreme holiness. Joanna Bazaljet accompanies her husband Jack, an officer in the Indian Civil Service, on a tour of the Punjab. She writes an account in her diary. An early start on the 12th for our 26-mile journey by river to Chaunta, some 70 bullock skins had been collected. Katnaus, they are called. The animal has been carefully skinned through the hind leg so that when the eyes, nose, mouth and other orifices have been patched, it forms an immense bladder which can be blown up through a leg by man puff. For us, they rig two skins side by side with a legless chair on each and a box between for our feet. Very comfortable. And each boat has an auxiliary crew of three or four to paddle, tow and guide us along and, very important, puff up our bladders every half an hour. One third of India consists of the princely states ruled by Maharajas and Nawabs. The Indian princes are favoured and flattered by the British Raj, which considers them useful figureheads for indirect rule and socially acceptable. On a tour of India, American tycoon Larry Thor visits one of the wealthiest states, Bikaneer, and films the marriage of the Maharaja Gunga Singh's granddaughter to the Prince of Udaipur. This has to be one of the most elaborate spectacles of modern times. The princely bridegroom arrives on his elephant and approaches a platform where an official paints the ceremonial caste mark on his forehead. 
Then the boy, the center of all attention, is carried off to the temple on a solid silver palanquin. It really is a magnificent affair. The ultimate social occasion for India's elite is the tiger hunt. Political power and prestige are traded as viceroy and maharajas mingle in the jungles of northern India and Nepal. Private Secretary Yvonne Fitzroy. His Excellency and the Maharaja climb each to their howders. They are exceptionally comfortable, but nothing can really assuage the pangs caused by the admirable creature's walk. The art is to let yourself go and just wobble. In a manual on tiger hunts, the Maharaja Bahadur Benali describes ring hunting. I first saw shooting tigers in rings when I was invited by my esteemed friend Colonel O'Connor. Buffalo calves were tied in the jungle as bait. About 50 elephants were sent out to circle the place where the tiger was likely to conceal itself. Then, when the ring was ready, orders were given for a couple of elephants to go inside and find out where the tiger was. The tiger which remained in circle for such a long time usually got enraged, charging the elephant that went near it. In the beginning, it's exciting. But after a while, the tiger becomes exhausted and lies down. With two or three rings being made a day, I have seen hundreds of tigers being shot. In just 10 weeks, Viceroy Lord Linlithgow's hunt kills 38 rhino, 27 leopards, 15 bears, and 120 tigers. While the British enjoy the luxuries of the Raj, most of their Indian subjects live in dire poverty. Podmasani Amal. The British Raj imposed taxes for everything. What are these taxes? Is it to suck out our life blood? They plunder us for our money and make us living corpses. Look into a railway carriage. There is breathing space for a gunny sack, but not for a man. It was in a train like this that my friend, Mopillai, died of suffocation. British India is divided into seven provinces with many languages and religions. Violence between Hindus and Muslims is commonplace. Nationalists blame the British for a policy of divide and rule, but one man devotes his life to uniting India, Mohandas K. Gandhi. India has become so poor that she has little power of resisting famines. Little do town dwellers know how the semi-starred masses of Indians are slowly sinking to lifelessness. I have no doubt that England and the town dwellers of India will have to answer if there is a God above for this crime against humanity.
By the 1930s, a new generation of British civil servants is beginning to understand India's plight. Writing to his mother in England, Assistant Commissioner of the Punjab, Penderal Moon. The poverty of the people is really astounding. Not so poor, no doubt, as 40 years ago, but they are conscious of their poverty nowadays and resent it. I don't know what the government is going to do about Gandhi. Unless we're very skillful or very lucky, the situation is going to get steadily worse. I'm all in favor of granting full dominion status in, say, 10 or 12 years. But I suppose the government can be trusted to move with that fatal slowness which constitutes ordered progress.